It's good to see you. God bless you for being here. Uh, we want to welcome not just our Cookville campus, but we welcome our Life Church family in Livingston, our Life Church family in Sparta, our Life Church family at Cookville South. Uh, no matter where you're at in the States or overseas, we're so honored that you would just study the Word of God with us, so welcome. Uh, and then we always give a special welcome to all of our family in the different correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to get right into it. I got several scriptures. Some of them you'll just have to write down and read them later, but I wanted to get this to you. But what we're going to talk about this weekend and uh, next weekend, Lord willing, is a message I've entitled, Who Do You Think You Are? Who do you think you are? And you're going to see, Lord, show us uh, how important that is. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 7, says this, as a man thinks, so is he. As a woman thinks, so is she. What that's saying is we are what we think. You know, have you heard the statement, you are what you eat? No, you are what you think. And so this message is who do you think you are? Now, notice Romans chapter 1, verse number 3. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul says this, I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself, now notice this, himself or herself, notice this, more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So I want us to stay balanced here. He did not say, don't think of yourself highly. He said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And we're going to talk about what that means. But here's what I've noticed. In my 55, going on 56 years of living, now I know that shocks you. Uh, <laughs> I took my daughter she is married now, uh, but we still go to the father-daughter dance. And so we went Friday night, and I saw a guy that I graduated high school with at a table across from me, and I went, he's old, golly. And so I asked my daughter, I said, you see that guy right there? She said, yeah. I said, do I look that old? She goes, <laughs> so I took her home early anyway. <laughs> But here's what I've noticed. In my years of living, I've noticed there's two out of balances when it comes to what we think about ourselves or how we see ourselves. There's two out of balances. The first one is when we think we're superior to other people. But the other is when we see ourselves as inferior to other people. See, God doesn't, doesn't want us to see ourselves as too important but he also doesn't want, doesn't want us to see ourselves as unimportant. Listen, how important are you? Uh, the blood of Jesus, that's pretty important. But we're going to talk about what does the balance look for and look like. And so I'm going to start with what does it look like when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think? And here's what I'm going to show you what it looks like. When you and I, when we think of ourselves as too important or more highly than we ought, here's what it is. We see ourselves as smarter than anybody else, including God. We live in a culture today that's much smarter than God, much smarter than God's Word. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 1, I'm going to read to you, this is exactly where our nation's at today. We've never been in this scripture like we are to this day. And notice this, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God. How many want to experience that today? You just really want to experience the wrath of God? Not me. I want to experience the love of God, don't you? But there's some people that experience the wrath of God, and here it is. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, here it is, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Notice what they do now, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It says people who suppress his truth, they're going to experience his wrath. Our nation is suppressing his truth like we never have before. We want it out of our universities. We want it out of our public schools. We want God out. Why? Because we're smarter than God today. Notice this. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they were without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here it is. Here it is. Professing to be, everybody say, wise. Oh, we're so smart. We're much smarter today than that dumb book. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, notice what wise people do. Here it is. And everybody say changed. They begin to change things that God never said to change. 
and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies. So much about what we do with our bodies today. Our bodies among themselves. Who? Everybody say exchanged. Oh, you see it? How smart people are. They exchanged what? The truth of God for the lie. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. What's that mean? We worship ourselves today. Who is blessed forever. And for this reason, God gave them up to vile. Oh, you're so smart. I'll just let you have it. Notice this. Gave them up to vile. For even their women, everybody say exchanged. You're going to see this word over and over again. Exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventing of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Just watch the news. That's all of us. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. What happens? A culture gets so smart and they really think so highly of themselves that they're smarter than God or that dumb book that was written a long time ago. See, there are two things. I'm going to talk to the church today. Talk to Christians. There are two things that is happening in every Christian's life. Every believer. So I'm talking to you. If you're saved, I'm talking to you and I'm talking to me. But the same thing or one of two things is happening in every believer's life today. Here it is. Either you're changing the Bible or the Bible's changing you. Either I'm, either the Bible is changing me or I'm changing the Bible. Notice Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The apostle Paul says, I beseech you. That word beseech means to beg. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So he's talking to the church. By the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Well, I'm, it's my body. I'll do what I want to with it. Now it says here, you better present it to God. Notice this, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conform to this world, but be, ye, everybody say transform, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove was a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Paul is saying right here, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. You know what he's really saying? He's saying whatever we conform to, we are being transformed by. So if you are, if we are conforming to culture, we are being transformed by this culture. Let me show you Matthew 25, verse 30 to 32. Matthew 25, 32 says this, all the nations will be gathered in his presence. It's about when Jesus comes back. And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Can I tell you that's happening right now? This is talking, Matthew 24, Matthew 25 is talking about the return of Christ when he comes back for the church. And it says one of the things going to happen is the sheep and the goats are going to be separated. That's talking about the church. See, it's not talking about the church from the world. We're already separated. He's talking about there's going to be sheep. See, for, for them to be separated, it must mean they were together. And so he says right before he comes, he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. Well, how do we know the difference, Pastor Bob? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. Here's how you know. Sheep follow goat's butt. See, sheep says whatever the word says. Goats look at it and says, well, I know it's what the Bible says, but you're a goat. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Listen, there's people today in the church that want Jesus without his word. You don't get Jesus without his word. You don't, he is the word. You don't get, listen, God and his word are one, the Bible says. So you don't get, we don't get Jesus without his word. Well, I don't like what that says. Well, he didn't think about you when he wrote it. And he didn't think about me. Oh, Bill won't like that, Jesus. We better take that part out. No, no, no. Thus saith the Lord. See, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. So, when it comes to the word of God, there are two groups of Christians today. There are those who defend the Bible and those who want to amend the Bible. There are those who defend the Bible and those who 
amend the Bible. And there's a lot of amending going on today. Let me show you what Paul says about that. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. I'm sorry, Peter. This is Peter. Peter's about to preach his first sermon after being filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice what Peter preaches. Acts 2, verse 40. And when many other words he, Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. May I repeat his words today? Be saved from this perverse generation. Listen to this. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So 3,000 people got saved. But notice what these saved people did. And they, everybody say, continued. And they continued steadfastly. What? In the apostles' doctrine, in the Bible, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers. Let me show you what Paul says about not staying in the word and defending the gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. So he says there's not another gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. That's strong. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And that's what Paul says. For do I, so he says, I'm going to tell you why I preach. This is a motivation for why I preach. What, Paul? For now do I persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You know what Paul was saying? I don't preach for you. I preach for him. You don't write my sermons. He writes my sermons. I say the same thing all the time. Listen, I preach for an audience of one. You get in on it. But I don't forget who I'm preaching for. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Paul says, but I fear. What are you afraid of, Paul? But I fear that somehow your pure and undefiled, undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, you happily put up with whatever someone tells you. Even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. You know what he's saying? Don't just listen to anybody. Let me tell you something. Here's how I know we're in the last days. Many signs are showing up, but Jesus said one of the main signs was there'd be false preachers popping up everywhere. The last two years I've been talking to you as our church about this, but now it seems like it's happening every other week. Two weeks ago, a preacher that I've looked up to for years, I have sent my staff to his conferences. He's one of the most famous preachers in America today, and he just went completely woke on us. I'm telling you the truth. He basically started saying things about sex and sexual immorality, and he condoned it, and he even said this. Here's what he said. He said, I know what Leviticus says. I know what 1 Corinthians 6 says. I know what Romans chapter 1 says. And then he says this, I know the clobber scriptures. And then he proceeded to tell people, you're okay if you live this way. He needs to sit down. He needs to sit down. Pastor Bob, no, you can't have God without his word. Let me tell you something. You know what that man has lost? He's lost the fear of the Lord. Pastor Bob, I thought you loved preachers. I do love preachers. Man, I spent time with preachers last week. I'll spend time with preachers this week, and I'll spend time with preachers next week. They're some of my favorite people. But when you get away from the word, I don't consider you a preacher no more. I consider you a heretic. First, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Notice what Paul says here. So he's got Timothy, which is a young pastor, and Paul's going to encourage him, but he's also going to challenge him. And listen to what he says, 2 Timothy 4, 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. That's what he told Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm going to give you a charge. God's called you to preach. Now, here's what you better understand. There's only one person going to judge you. Only one. It ain't some politician. It's not some other preacher. It's not a denomination. Jesus Christ is going to judge you. You better preach the word. And that's what he says next. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come. What? When they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own, everybody say desires. According to their own, I, want, I don't want that to be true. I want this to be true. According to their own desires, uh, 
Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. Fables. But you, Timothy, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. He says, I want you to know something. In the last days, false preachers are going to get up and they're going to pervert the word of God. And they're going to tell people what people want to hear. And he said, but Timothy, don't you do it. You preach the word. And then he says this, endure afflictions. afflictions. You know why he said that? Because when another one of these woke joke preachers get up and start telling people what they want to hear, our culture runs to them, and then they start hating on people like me. You know why? Because I love them enough to tell them the truth. That's why. I love them. I want them to make heaven. Acts 20, verse 25. Pastor Bob, you're usually funny. Well, this ain't funny today. This is serious business. Acts chapter 20, verse 25, Paul says, And indeed now I know you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. You know what he's saying? They're fixing to kill me. You know why they killed Paul? Because of what he preached. Now notice what he says next. Therefore I testify to you to this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Why are you innocent of the blood of all men, Paul? For I have not shunned to declare you to the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. Now he's talking to preachers. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Listen to what Paul's saying. He said, I'm fixing to kill me. I'm innocent of the blood of all men, but I want to talk to you pastors. You better preach the word of God that he purchased with his, it ain't your church, preacher. It wasn't your blood. It wasn't your cross. Jesus owns the church. Now notice this. For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. What are these wolves going to do? All some among you, yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. They're just looking for a big crowd. Let me tell you something. I'm grieved. I'm not angry. I don't get up here and bash preachers, and you know that. But when I heard this man with my own ears say these things, perverted things I'm sitting there thinking not him surely not this guy it blew my mind not this guy and then I wondered how did he get there because if you'd ask him 20 years ago well but there, there, well there'll be a day you'll stand behind a pulpit and call the word of God ir, uh, irrelevant I guarantee he'd have said no see deception happens over time you know what happened here's what I believe happened for the last 30 years he's focused on leadership His whole ministry is all about leadership. See, he's elevated leadership over followership. He's gotten more focused on who he's leading than on who he's following. Are you listening to me? Listen to what Paul said about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, be ye followers of me, even, everybody say, as, as I also am of Christ. You know what Paul's saying there? Hey, follow me as I follow Christ. You know what else he's saying there then? If I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. If I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. How do you know if you're following Christ, Pastor Bob? Are you sticking with the book? Sticking with the book. Here's how I know that. Because he says, now I praise you. What are you going to praise him about, Paul? Brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them. You've stuck with the book. Way to go, guys. Notice this. This is something that I use when I go talk to preachers. I've been invited to speak to some preachers here in the next couple weeks. And every time now, especially in the culture we're living in, when I speak to pastors and leaders in the body of Christ, I use this passage right here, John chapter 3, verse 26. This is where John the, John the Baptist was the mega pastor back then. It says all men were coming to him. Thousands were coming to hear him preach on the backside of the desert. And he was baptizing thousands of people. And notice what it says here. And they came to John. This is his staff. And said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are going to him. You know what he's saying? They're leaving our church and going to his church. He was talking about Jesus. Notice this. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You must yourself bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Can I tell you, every time I get on this platform, here's what I'm wanting to happen. I'm wanting to decrease in your life so he can increase in your life. I'm not here to get you in love with me. I'm here to get you in love with him. 
That's what I'm here for. That's what John was saying. That's what John was saying. He was saying, hey, boys, you got this wrong. I'm not the groom. I'm the best man. She's not my bride. See, some preachers have forgotten that. Let me tell you, back in Jesus' day, you know who was responsible for the wedding, for the bride's wedding? It wasn't the parents. Boys, don't you wish we was in that day today? I paid for a wedding last year. Thank God I had one girl. But here's the thing. In Jesus' day, you know who was responsible for the wedding? The best man. He had to make sure the bride was ready for the groom. That's what preachers are. See, here's the thing. Think about it a minute, boys. If you were about to marry your sweetheart and you had a best friend that went, 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 went to school with you all the way through elementary, junior high, high school, and he's your best friend, and you also ask him to be your best man, and on the night of the rehearsal, you go back in the back, and he's flirting with your bride. You're going to have the ministry of laying on of hands, aren't you? <laughs> See, we got preachers flirting with his bride. They're wanting the bride's affection. No, no, no. My job is to get you in love with him. I want you ready for the wedding. Amen. See, here's the problem. These woke preachers and teachers today have elevated their opinion above the word of God. And you know what God's asking them and me today? Who do you think you are? You have forgotten who I am. They have traded in vulnerability toward God for their own personal ability. The very first pastor in the Bible was a man named Moses. He shepherded two million people out of bondage. And I want you to see Moses before he became Israel's pastor. Notice this, Acts 7, verse 23. Now, when he was 40 years old, now you got to understand, Moses here is the step-grandson to the king. He lives in the palace. He's the king's grandson. Notice this. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian taskmaster. Notice this. For he supposed that his brethren would understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Moses, you know what he was saying? You know who I am? And so he's going to deliver now the children of Israel from Egypt, and evidently he's going to do it one at a time by killing the Egyptians. You seeing this? And so the Israelites, you know what, the, the, the one who, he killed this Egyptian, you know what the Israelites said? Who do you think you are to come and avenge us like this? So what happens is Moses then has to flee because he's afraid Pharaoh will hear it and have him executed. So Moses goes to the backside of the desert for 40 years. Why? Because God needed to humble him. Now let me show you this. It says, but Moses supposed that his brother would understood that God would deliver by his hand. Moses was going to deliver these people by his hand. Now, what did he suppose? I'm the man. Do you know who I am? Now, notice this in Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to skip down to verse 7, guys, to save some time. So we got the burning bush. It's 40 years later. And notice what happens. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land, uh, to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites. And now there, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. You know what the Lord said? I've come to deliver the children of Israel. And I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, notice this, this is a different Moses. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? See, 40 years earlier, he was like, do you know who I am? 40 years later, he's going, who am I? He got humbled. Notice this, that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he said, I will certainly be with you, the Lord said. And this shall be a sign that, to you that I have sent to you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? I love this. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's one bad dude right there. You know what he's saying? I'm God all by myself. You tell him I don't need nobody. Notice this, and he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. See, 40 years earlier, Moses was saying, do you know who I am? 40 years later, God's saying, do you know who I am? 
See, Moses, when God shows up this time, Moses says, who am I? And God says, it ain't about you who you are. It's about who I am. God's every day asking us, who do you think you are? Because if you don't see that right, you won't, think, you won't know who he is. Now, so 40 years earlier, Moses was depending on his ability. 40 years later, Moses was in a place of vulnerability because he knew he needed God's ability. Notice this, Exodus 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Listen, what? so 40 years later, God comes to him and Moses says, hey, I don't speak good. My speech is not good. It's slow. But notice 40 years earlier, Acts, 4, uh, Acts 7, verse 22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in what? Powerful in speech and action. In our day, this would have been, hey, I'm about to move, uh, introduce to you Moses, and he's graduated from Harvard and Yale, and he's going to come up here, and he's very powerful. See, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the deal. In Egypt, Moses had an education, but he still lacked a consecration to God. So let me say it to you this way. Education without God's participation still leaves you in a bad situation. Get your education, but make sure there's a consecration to God. Why? Because you can't do it without him, and neither can I. Notice this. Exodus 4, verse 1. Moses answered. I love that. That screen totally went out, so I can preach all day long. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. Them nursery workers will kill me and you both. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered, What if they do, not, they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? Everybody say, A staff. A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. And it became a snake and he ran from it. So he's not Pentecostal either. Notice this. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. I love this. Oh, get a hold of this. Moses said, I can't do it. See, 40 years earlier, you know who I am? 40 years later, I can't do it. And God says, Hey, what's that in your hand, Mo? He goes, A staff. He said, Hey, throw that down before me. Throw it down before me. Now, here's, here's what's cool. The definition of a staff is this, a long stick carried in the hand for support in walking or a supporting rod. You know what that was? That was a sign of his weakness. It was his dependency. Notice this now. When he picked it back up after throwing it before God, Exodus 4.20, then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took, everybody say, the rod of God the rod of God in his hand. Moses' stick went from a staff to support to the rod of God. What does that mean? When we give it to God, he can turn our weakness into his weapon. The same stick, listen to this, the same stick Moses depended on for support, his crutch, if you will, was the stick he was now using to bring Israel's deliverance. It was the same stick, the stick that used to have to hold him up because he was old now and weak. It's the same stick he was bringing the plagues upon Egypt. It's the same stick he parted the Red Sea with. It's the same stick that he talked, uh, caused water to come out of a rock. See, it was no longer a staff for support. It was now the rod of God. God took Moses' dependency and used it to bring Israel's deliverance. Ladies and gentlemen, God can turn our dependency into another person's deliverance. Case in point, 30 years ago, I was bound by drugs. They had me in a chokehold, and I couldn't get out of it. But Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God set me free. And for the last 30 years, he's used that weakness to become his weapon. And I've been able to help a lot of people who had a drug addiction. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. I don't know what your weakness is. Your weakness may be depression. I've been there too. But God can deliver you from depression, and once he does, he'll take you to depressed people. Why? Because he'll take your weakness and turn it into his weapon if you'll throw it down before him. See, a lot of times we just keep clutching on to our crutch. Now, he says, give it to me, and I'll turn that weakness into a weapon. Listen, Judges chapter 7. I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but we got a guy named Gideon. Gideon has 22,000 soldiers, and he's about to fight God's enemy, the Midianites, who has over 100,000 soldiers. And God comes to Gideon, and he says, hey, you've got too many. Hello. 
They got over 100,000. I've got 22,000. And God says, you got too many. You know Gideon probably said, now I know you're God and you're creator, but I don't know if math is your greatest subject. <laughs> right? So God says, you've got too many. So I, here's what I want you to do. Go back and tell all your soldiers, those that are scared, they can go home. 12,000 left him just like that. He had 10,000 soldiers left to fight over 100,000. God said, you still got too many. So here's what I want you to do. Take them down to the riverbank. Those that lap like a dog, you send them home. Those that cup and drink out of their hand, you keep them. Gideon ended up with 300 men. Gideon, God, and those 300 men defeated all the Midianites. What, what was God doing? I want you so vulnerable, you have to have me. You know what God told him? He said, why am you getting me down to 300? He said, because when this is over, I want you to know who I am. Amen. Who do you think you are? No, it's about who I am. And the Bible says they defeated all the Midianites. See, here's the, here's the key. Our vulnerability is God's opportunity to show himself strong in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we've got Paul who has this thorn in the flesh and it just keeps beating him up and beating him up. And he says, God, deliver me from this. God, deliver me from this. And I love this. Each time he, God said, my grace is all you need. Listen to what God said. My power works best in weakness. Pastor Bob, I'm in a weak place in life right now. Oh, you're in a good place. Why? Because God says my power specializes in your weakness. My vulnerability is your opportunity. Notice this. So now I am glad, Paul says, to boast in my weakness. Why? So that the power of Christ can work through me. You've got to understand something. Paul was brilliant. Paul was a brilliant, brilliant person. If you go read his resume from you that's from banging with me, the resume. <laughs> but if you, Paul was brilliant. He studied at the feet of Gamel. What is that? It would be like a Harvard student today. But Paul, even though he was brilliant, he threw all of his education, if you will, away for the sake of Christ. And this is what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not to you with excellence of speech or man's wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstrations of the spirit and power. Why? So that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know what he's saying? Hey, don't get so caught up in me about being a preacher. Just fall in love with Jesus and watch what he does in your life. That's what we need in America today is people who depend on the power of God. We've become too smart for our own good. My son, listen, God is calling you to step out into vulnerability. If you want to see God do what he's never done in your life, you've got to step out into vulnerability. Listen, if you're going to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. My son, my son Christopher, my son will tell you he don't like talking to four people, let alone 400 people. He's just, he's just not a big talker. He's not stuck up or anything. He's just not a big talker. He's not like me and his sister. We will talk you to death. But Chris, we had him preach this Wednesday night, first time he ever preached. And he, I'm going to tell you, let me tell you something. You don't, know how, you don't really know how difficult that was for Chris. But he stepped out into vulnerability. And I'm going to tell you something. Everybody that was here saw God's ability upon his life. It was, I mean, it blew me away. I'm like, Jennifer, that's my kid. That ain't your kid. <laughs> I'm serious. But you know, what, you know what Chris told me? When he got done, he said, Dad, I felt him. I felt him. What did he do? He stepped out into vulnerability. What are you missing out on because you won't step out into vulnerability? I, I went to the Harley shop this week, and one of the guys that worked at the Harley shop said, I heard your son preached at Life Church. I'm like, Harley, are y'all kidding me? Now, if I'd have went in the Honda shop, they wouldn't even know what that meant. But anyway, uh, hey, hey, that white horse Jesus comes back on, its name is Harley, just so you know. <laughs> Me and some guys from the church uh, a few weeks ago was riding down in the Franklin area, Cool Springs. We'd come out of this restaurant. And this elderly lady came, and she told the sky was really dark like it is right now. And she said, you boys are about to get wet. I said, no, ma'am, we're on Harleys. The rain just goes around us. I said, now, if it was on Hondas, we'd get soaked. And I'll let you know that I did get baptized. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying to you is this. If you'll write down John 14, 16, John 14, 26, and John 16, 7, I don't have time to read it. 
But Jesus is introducing the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And here's the first title he gave him, the comforter. I'm going to send you the comforter. Years ago, I was reading in my devotions, and I read that scripture, and Jesus said, the reason a lot of people in the church are not experiencing more of the Holy Spirit is because only the uncomfortable need a comforter. Oh, I want more of the Holy Spirit. Why? So we can sit in our lazy boy? Oh, seriously. If you want to experience more of the comforter, you've got to step out into the uncomfortable. How many things are we not seeing God do because we just, I'm just scared to step out there. I'm telling you, I, told, I reminded my son of this. He didn't remember the story and he was nervous about speaking. I said, Chris, I dropped speech my first day of college. I did. I sat in that room and the teacher said, tomorrow, everybody's going to come in here and give a two minute speech. And I looked around that room and there's about 35 people sitting in there and I'm like, there's no way I can speak in front of 35 people. Hello. What are you missing? God, God wants, listen, God will never call you to do something you can do without him, ever. Matthew chapter 10, I'm going to skip down to the last verse, verse 16. Jesus is sending his disciples out into the world to evangelize for him. He tells them, don't take money with you. Don't take any food with you. Don't take any extra clothing. Don't take anything. And then he says this, listen to this. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Now think about it a minute. Jesus said, I don't want you to take any provisions with you. Don't take any extra money. Don't take any extra food. Don't take any extra clothing. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe Jesus loved his disciples? Yes. Now, would you send your kids out like that? Would you send your kids out as sheep among wolves? No. What was Jesus doing here? He was sending them out vulnerable. What was he saying? I want you so dependent on me that you ain't got nothing else but me. See, often we don't know that God's all we need until he's all we got. Do you hear me? He wants us, he wants us as a place of vulnerability. Why? So we can be dependent on his ability, not our own. I'll close with this. About seven or eight years ago, I got into a place of the greatest vulnerability I'd ever been in my life outside of when I was bound 30 years ago. And what had happened was this church, God had just so breathed on us and placed his grace on us that people were getting saved and people were coming and getting baptized. And it just, it grew faster than I was, to be honest with you. And I began to feel the weight of the church and it began to crush me. And I became very weak, if you will. Now I realize why I went through that because God will take you through something to take you to something. He's always into making us stronger. But in the midst of that, there was a guy that I really loved that I thought really loved me and would always stand with me and be with me. But during that vulnerability, I'll never forget, we were in a meeting one day and there were some other pastors out of the Nashville area in that meeting. Here's what he said to me. He looked at me and he said, PB, for Pastor Bob, when are you ever going to admit it? This church is just too big for you. And I said, bud, that's the only thing you and I agree on in this meeting today. I said, but what scares me is it's too big for you too. You just don't know it. Let me tell you something. This church was too big for me when it was 70 people. Why? When you get the call and you go to a bedside of a married couple that's been married for 67 years and she's laying there about to enter into eternity, and it's going to be the first time he's ever been on earth without her in 67 years. You better have God with you. When you get to call like I did 10 o'clock at night in my house, I'm getting ready to go to bed, and I get the call, hey, Pastor Bob, can you come to the hospital? And I get over there, and a lady and a husband that I had just led to the Lord three months earlier, she's sitting there holding her 18-year-old son's dead hand and looks at me and says, I need you to explain this to me. You better have God walk in there with you. This church has always been too big for me, but it's not too big for my God, and he helped me understand that. <laughs> Amen? I hope I always see what God's doing is too big for me. Why? Because if I don't, then I think I've got this. You don't want me to get this. I will mess you up. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So here's where we're at today. We'll pick up here next week. Our nation's in trouble, guys. Duh. Pastor Bob, you're just now figuring that out? No. 
Now, we're, we're really in trouble. Greater than many of us even think. We're at a real crossroad right now. And we've got a corrupt, woke culture that wants to take this thing and turn it completely 180 and take us away from everything that God sees as holy. Now, let me tell you where I've been the last couple of years. I've been frustrated. I've been frustrated with the left woke crowd that wants to do away with everything that our forefathers fought for for this nation. But I've also been frustrated with some, not all, but some on the right. Let me tell you why. Because they think if we'll just get a little louder and scream more and our veins pop out and we spit on people more, that'll change this nation. That will not change this nation. Did you hear me? That will not change this nation. Here's what the Lord spoke to me as I was studying for this. God's not looking for a superstar politician. He's not looking for a superstar pastor. He's looking for a group of college students that'll get on a campus and pull on heaven until it falls on this nation. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. See, we got people that says, if we'll stand up, we can save this nation by our hand. No, we can't. Neither could Moses. What we've got to do is get on our knees and pull on heaven and say, God, we've been trying to do it without you. Would you come? Would you come and do in this nation what only you can do? And it's hitting in college campuses all throughout our nation now. I just went to Tennessee Tech Thursday night, me and some pastors, and we prayed with about 400 college students for God to come visit this community. That's what's going to change this nation. God's saying to us, quit focused on who do you think you are. Do you know who I am? And you know what's amazing? This was crazy. So this movie that just came out, Jesus Revolution, so that movie's about what happened in the 1970s when the Jesus movement happened and the Spirit of God fell and a bunch of hippies that smoked pot got saved. And many of them are still pastoring churches today. But you know what happened at the same time that was happening? There was a revival that hit a college campus named Asbury. Uh-oh. I think he may be doing it again. Did you hear me? That's not, that's not a coincidence. That's called a godsidence. He's beginning to move throughout the, why? Because he's just saying this, quit depending on your ability and your ability to speak good and, 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 and get the right person in office. I mean, I think we should vote biblically, but what God's saying is, if my people will humble themselves and seek my face, I will come and I will heal their land. That's what we need, ladies and gentlemen. That's the only thing that's going to change us. Listen, who do you think you are? God doesn't want you to see yourself as superior smarter than he is, but he also don't want us to see ourselves as inferior, just good for nothing. No, no. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to change that question to where we're looking up into heaven and who do we think you are? You know who I think he is? I think he's still the same I am as he was thousands of years ago. Amen? Amen. Stand up with me, please. Stand up with me. We'll pick it up here next week. Father, thank you. Lord, Without you, we can do nothing. But Lord, with you, all things are possible. So Lord, thank you that you are again visiting our nation. Father, thank you that Lord, I do believe we're in the last days. I believe it, but Lord, I also believe that there's an, an end time revival. You said you, at the last days, you'll pour out your spirit on all flesh. So Lord, I believe you're gonna gather a bunch of souls up and then we're going home. Help us be a part of it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Head bowed and eyes closed. There's a story in the Bible where the disciples are out in the boat and they're in the midst of a storm. And it, this is not the story where Jesus was in the boat with them. He was actually walking on the water. The thing that's trying to get on top of them, he's on top of. And he's walking on the water. And the Bible tells us he would have passed them by but they hollered out, Master, is that you? It says he would have passed them by. Hey, don't let Jesus pass you by. All you got to do is call on him. Because the Bible says the moment he got in their boat, they were immediately on the land. You'll never get to where you're going safely without him in your boat. So this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. Jesus is here. All you got to do is call on him. See, the Bible says we'll not escape if we neglect so great of a salvation. What's that mean? We've said this, that the cross 
was Jesus' marriage proposal to you. The cross is the most expensive engagement ring that's ever been purchased. It's him getting down on one knee saying, will you marry me? I do. How about you? See, salvation is just an exchange of vows. And so some of you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and you need to do that. But some of you were like me, and there's been a lot of distance between you and Jesus. It's time to renew your vows. Either one of those, I want to lead you in a prayer that we find in the Bible where Jesus can come in and do what he needs to do in your life. But if that's you, wherever you're at, whatever campus, whatever jail cell, if that's you, say, I'm ready. Lift your hand up. That's me. That's me. Amen. 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 But you know you've been prayed for. You're here on purpose. You're there on purpose. I want everybody to pray this with me, please. Everybody pray this. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me, and I believe God raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my King. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate with you. Amen. Praise God.